Hi everyone, um, my name is Michael Holsworth. I'm the Managing Director for the Payable Insights team in the Americas and I'm very happy to be talking today with Elizabeth Linos, who is Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. And we want to talk to Elizabeth about a really interesting study that she's run recently um, that we think illuminates um, something about how behavioral science has been applied in practice, what we've uh, what has been achieved and what more needs to be done in the future. So um, Elizabeth, thank you very much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. I'm excited to talk about this work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's great because it is a fascinating um, study. So I suppose kicking off, what, what in a, you know, a sentence, in a summary, were you looking to find out from running this uh, piece of research? Sure. Um, and I should say, this is work co-authored with Stefano De La Vigna, who is also a professor at UC Berkeley, and with excellent research assistance by Wu Jin Kim, who supported um, all the analytics that are behind this project. So um, in a nutshell, what we were trying to look at is um, you know, the overall effect. If you took a step back and you looked at the overall effect of taking uh, nudges that have really exploded both in the academic literature, but also in government, what would be the average effect of an edge across policy areas and across contexts? And the, the reasoning behind this is essentially, you know, we've been doing this work quite a bit uh, over the past decade since the book came out, since the Behavioral Insights team launched, um, but we didn't have kind of a comprehensive sense of, you know, all of these trials that are being done, hundreds of trials that are being done um, by nudge units. Um, and so we thought it would be an interesting exercise to uh, take a look at what is the average effect of a nudge across all these areas and compare it to what we see in the academic literature. That's great, thank you. And I think it's fair to say these kind of studies that you're talking about are not that common still. It takes quite a lot of effort to, to get to these um, kind of conclusions. So how did you go about that? Yeah, um, it's true that it takes a lot of uh, work to get to this point. Um, you need two things to be able to do this kind of project. On the one hand, there's the kind of econometric work that uh, Stefano Wujin and myself did on the paper, but you need to have on the back end um, documentation of you know, all the trials that have been run. And so this project is only possible because both the Behavioral Insights team in North America and OES, which was the other large um, nudge unit that we worked with, kept real documentation of every single trial that's run. Now, I wanna emphasize how rare that is. Um, in academia, we only see a portion of all the trials that any given academic runs uh, because there's no um, norm about presenting to the world every single randomized control trial that you've run. But these two nudge units had documentation of every trial protocol and every trial report that they ran. And so what we did, an academic team is took all this information uh, did uh, a bunch of econometric work to expand on what we know about meta-analytic techniques to try to get a, you know, one correct average treatment effect across a bunch of different policy areas. Um, and essentially we end up with uh, nudges or trials that have affected more than 27 million people across the US, both at the federal level and at the state and local level. That is a lot of people. Um... So that, that, that's really interesting. And are we talking about uh, any particular policy areas, uh, you know, or is it a spread across different ones? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's really exciting about the expansion of behavioral insights into government is that it has been used across a bunch of different policy areas. And so, you know, in these trials that we've seen, we're looking at 126 different trials spanning different policy areas, different government agencies, different levels of government. Um, and so we're really trying to get um, an estimate of what a nudge can do, as opposed to what people have done before us, which have looked at kind of behavioral insights for recycling or behavioral insights for energy conservation. This is really trying to take a much broader look at the entire span of projects that you can do uh, as part of a nudge unit. Thanks. and then. Zoom, zooming in maybe, um, is there like one um, study from this big data set that you can just talk through briefly to kind of give people a sense of what we're talking about in terms of interventions? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So 
you know, we found when we looked through all of these trials, we found some commonalities that, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I didn't expect. So one thing we noticed is that almost all the trials that have been run by these teams have um, an outcome that is essentially a binary outcome, a zero one. Um, what that means is you're looking at whether or not someone took up a program or not, whether someone signed up for a new service or not, whether or not someone uh, decided to save or not, or clicked on something or not. And because those are binary, um, you're able to kind of compare across because it's the same type of behavioral outcome. Now, a typical project might be something like, like um, helping uh, veterans save more for retirement or um, working within uh, a city, helping people um, pay, their, pay their parking tickets. There's a really, you know, quite a big range of policy areas, but they all have this commonality and that usually it's um, a government agency communicating with residents and encouraging them to take up a service or participate in a program uh, that are both mandatory and non-mandatory programs. Great, thank you very much. Um, and so, you know, what did you find um, stepping back from this data set? What are your main conclusions? Yeah, so, you know, I was really excited as a behavioral scientist myself to see that, you know, spanning 126 trials with 23 million people involved, we do see a significant positive effect of nudges. Um, the size of the effect, depending on how you count it, is about you know, one, 1 1.6 percentage point, between 1.4 and 1.6 percentage points. Um, and that translates to an increase of about 8% um, over the control. Now, I want to emphasize that, you know, most of the work that we see in government is never evaluated. So we never actually get such a crisp estimate of the impact of a program or um, a new service. But when we have tested things using this robust evaluation methodology that both nudge units use, it's very common to see that the overall effect is zero. And so finding a positive and significant effect across such a large range of trials is really, I think, promising and exciting for the field of behavioral science. Now, you know, one thing that we do see is that this effect is much smaller than what you would think the effect of a nudge is if you just looked at the academic literature. So if you just looked at meta-analyses that exist in published academic journals, the effect um, that you would find is about eight percentage points. And so the majority of our paper is trying to reconcile that gap to really understand why we see these numbers that are fundamentally different, although both positive and significant. That's, that's really interesting. Um, obviously, a lot of the time we think about academic um, studies as being, you know, reliable and um, uh, accurate, although obviously there's, you know, scientific methods all about debate and critique. Um, how can you be confident in the findings that you've set out here? Why do you think that, you know, this is a good representation of what's going on? Yeah, there's a couple of reasons um, we're pretty confident in these results. So one, and this is, I think, um, a testament to how behavioral insights has grown as a field, one thing that's really quite exciting about the field of behavioral insights is that it grew alongside a, a, a real commitment to using randomized control trials to evaluate the impact of behavioral insights. And that's very rare. I, I can't you know, point to any other um, type of intervention where you consistently see robust evaluations. And so you know, on the one hand, we're certain that these results are real because they've all been evaluated using our golden standard of evaluation, randomized control trials. The second reason we're excited about these results is because for these two nudge, nudge units, we can see the full span of all the trials that they ran. And so um, that's different than academia where we only see trials that end up getting published. There's a, a, a phrase that we're, you know, we're still working through in, in a academia, whether we're gonna call it publication bias or selective publication, but um, there's no question that not all randomized control trials that are run by academics end up in academic journals. Some people call this the file drawer problem. Um, and it's not necessarily a problem at the stage of publication. It might be that people don't even write up their results if they don't see significant positive findings. And so what we've seen in the academic literature could still be quite robust in terms of the specific project, but we're not seeing the entirety of all the projects that have been run um, on that topic. And so um, in some ways we're overestimating the effect of nudges if we just look um, at, at published results. 
uh, in our case, we're, we're pretty confident and we've, you know, we've pushed it econometrically in different ways and we've done lots of robustness checks. We're pretty confident that the you know, true effect of a nudge in these, in these nudge units is around you know, 1.4 to 1.6 percentage points, as, as I noted. And well, one small thing which I found interesting in, in your paper as well was the way you were talking about the fact that many of these studies are, have better statistical power or in some ways uh, set up to, to be more robust in their results than some of the academic uh, findings. Could you just explain that briefly, please? Sure. Um, so when we say that we believe a finding uh, in, in kind of the statistical sense, when we say that an effect is statistically significant, essentially what we're saying is, you know, at a really conceptual level, what is the likelihood, if there is a true effect, that we would capture it um, in the trial that we run? So what's the, what's the likelihood that if we ran this over and over again, we would get similar results? Those are slightly different concepts, but the, the basic premise is that uh, we want to be certain that the effect that we see is not um, by chance. There are a couple of ways that we do that or we um, ensure that our effects are robust. One of the key ways is to have a big enough sample. So when you have a very, very large sample, statistically, you're going to have the same number of men and women, the same number of old people and young people, the same number of motivated and unmotivated people in your groups. And so the only difference that you see between these two large groups is you know, a change that is due to your intervention, nothing else that is causing that difference. The smaller those groups, the more likely it is that by chance you're gonna have other differences between these groups. And so statistical power is essentially trying to capture um, how robust or how credible our findings are, where the larger the sample size, the better in terms of credibility and robustness. Now it turns out, and this is I think one of the beauties of taking what we've learned in the academic literature to scale at government is that you go from an environment where you're quite limited in the number of people that you can test things on to an environment where you know it might be thousands or, or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people who are all being served by the same government. And so what we found in our study is that actually the sample sizes in these nudge units are much, much larger than what we see in the average academic paper. And with that comes robustness and findings. Um, now, that by itself wouldn't be a problem if we could see all the papers that have been published in, um, or all the papers that have been done by academics, because you would see small effects, some would be positive, some would be negative, some would be zeros, you'd have a lot more variation. But if for reasons like selective publication or publication bias, you only see the subset of those trials that have a positive finding, then you're really kind of um, comparing uh, apples to oranges. Uh, in some ways, the, the sample sizes that we're seeing in the nudge units are uh, more correct or more credible just because they're larger. And that means that we trust the results of those trials more. And taking this back to the policymakers in terms of practical implications, what, what would you say to a, to a policymaker looking uh, to apply some of these findings in practice? I know you mentioned, for example, that the relatively low cost they seem to be from, from your analysis. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one thing that um, I noted at the beginning is that we've already seen an explosion of, uh, of nudge units in governments across the world. We, I think we have over 200 units across the world. So already we're seeing governments um, normalize the use of behavioral insights and randomized control trials in government, which in and of itself is exciting. I think what um, this research suggests is that overall, um, the return on investment of these trials is, is positive and significant. Um, you know, almost 60%, I think, of the trials um, that we looked at had uh, essentially a zero cost or zero marginal cost of being run. And so the fact that we can see a significant positive effect of these trials suggests that there is a very positive return on investment. And so if I were a policymaker, I would take this evidence and say two things. One, um, nudges seem to work overall on average, or at least the ones that are run by nudge units. But I would be cautious about um, what I expect can be accomplished with a nudge. Now, behavioral insights, as you know, is much bigger than just nudges. Um, and behavioral science teams or behavioral insights units across the world um, are, are quite nuanced or quite thoughtful about you know, what you can accomplish with a nudge versus what you can accomplish with other types of policy levers that might still incorporate behavioral insights. 
And so I think as a policymaker, what this research suggests is that if you want, you know, a 50% effect or you want to, you know, uh, have a huge impact on your policy area, you can't rely uh, merely on the nudge. You have to look beyond just nudges um, and use other tools from behavioral science or from psychology and economics more broadly. Um, so, you know, in some ways, this is both an optimistic and a, and a, a realistic look at what you can expect from, from a nudge if you're a policymaker. So uh, what do we need to find out next? What are you interested in studying, building on, on the findings from this study? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and there's a lot of different directions uh, we could go with this, with this work. Um, I think one question that a lot of us are interested in, both on the public policy or government side, as well as in academia, is you know, the heterogeneous effects of nudges. And what I mean by that is, if this paper tells us, look, this is the average effect of a nudge, um, we might be curious to understand with a lot more um, granularity what is the effect of a nudge for certain types of people. For example, uh, people who are underserved or more likely to um, need assistance from government. We might be interested in looking at specific policy areas and learning, you know, actually nudges are really effective in this type of policy arena, but not very effective in others. You know, or even further, these are the kinds of nudges that are implemented well by governments um, and that could look very different than what we know, you know, works well in academic settings. And so I think, you know, building in, in you know, more granularity or more understanding of the heterogeneous effects of nudges is, is a next step. Another thing that I'm really excited to study further is kind of the political economy of nudge units themselves. And what I mean by that is, yes, a lot of these trials have zero cost or are um, relatively low cost compared to other policy levers we have. But you know, really understanding um, the uh, effort and resources that are involved in building a nudge unit and factoring that into our calculations of cost benefit is a really exciting exercise. Um, look, if, you know, if things continue as they have over the past 10 years, we're gonna see a nudge unit or behavioral science team in every government in the world. Um, in some ways that's great because it's gonna normalize the use of behavioral insights um, in government, but I think it's really interesting to study you know, how do these teams end up deciding what project to work on? What's the marginal benefit uh, of this approach given other approaches when things become more normalized and we move before, you know, beyond the initial um, types of trials that every nudge unit runs? So I'm excited about that. Um, but I think what's most interesting given what we've seen uh, in this project is what happens when you take an idea from academia, take it to scale in government and continue to do what is essentially you know, an evidence-based policymaker's dream, which is to build robust evaluation in the process of rolling out government interventions. And I think these nudge units have uh, a really strong uh, role to play, not only normalizing behavioral insights, but normalizing the use of randomized control trials and policy. So I'm excited to see how that develops over time as well. Well, that's great. And I think that's a, a good note on which to, to end, actually. Um, thank you, Professor Linus, for uh, conducting this, this really great study that I think adds a lot to our understanding of applied behavioral science. And thanks for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. It was my pleasure.